Well, thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be with you all here today, the distinguished company of the speakers who have graced this stage uh, thus far. The topic on the docket for us this afternoon is uh, it's a small, compact, and concise one. It is Asia, the future, and whether Asia is the future of the art market. And, and here I should note that I am by no means the world's greatest expert on Asia, and I'm here primarily as the understudy for my vastly more qualified colleague, Vivian Chow, who is uh, a native Hong Konger. She's one of the finest art journalists on the region, and sadly, she could not make it here today. Very fortunately, um, I am here in the presence of two absolutely formidable experts on the topic, uh, who you could say are not only deeply familiar with the Asian art market, but who have had a major hand in shaping it as it exists now. Emmy Yu is the executive director of the STPI workshop in Singapore, and she is also the foundational force behind the C-Focus Art Fair, which is a tightly curated platform for artists and dealers from Southeast Asia. Now, Magnus Renfrew is going to go down in the history books as the founder of Art HK, the Hong Kong International Art Fair, which really established Hong Kong as this epicenter of the, uh, the global art market and evolved into Art Basel Hong Kong, where his founding director, Magnus, really did Herculean work in shifting the axis of the global art market eastward towards Asia. Today, more recently, since 2019, he has been the, executive, he has been the founding director of Taipei Dangdai, which is the very impressive art fair in Taiwan's capital city. So, um, you know, as a, as a note of clarification, when I speak of Asia in the panel today, I'm going to be referring specifically to East Asia, which encompasses greater China, uh, South Korea, Japan, and Singapore. So um, without further ado, let's dive in, because we have a lot of ground to cover. And let's begin where the current phenomenal trajectory of the uh, Asian art market really you know, launched from, which is Hong Kong. So in 2007, you founded Art HK. Um, long time ago. Now, Magnus, I'm, yeah. I'm very curious to hear, what did you think could be achieved with an art fair in Hong Kong in 2007? And, and what did you think the needs of the regional art market were back then? Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to speak today. It's a great honor to be amongst such great speakers. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, we were quite ambitious right from the outset with Hong Kong. Um, I'd been lucky enough to be living in China for a year prior to, uh, prior to the, the helping set up the first edition of the fair. And so I think that we'd seen firsthand at that kind of particular moment, the sort of 2006 to 2008 moment, there was a huge awakening worldwide with regards to the Chinese contemporary art market. Um, you had the first big auctions in New York, for example, of Chinese contemporary art in 2007 in the spring where well, yeah, there was the first work that was sold for over a million US dollars. And people's awareness of the increasing role of China was really uh, becoming more, um, more and more to the fore. Um, we saw the opportunity in Hong Kong um, for a major international fair that was less, um, less West-centric, I think, in terms of focus. We had the opportunity to try and set up uh, an art fair from scratch. We had the opportunity to think, how could you make this the best art fair for now? And you can be the best in terms of the absolute terms of if the best 100 galleries are from New York or from Berlin, then you have 100 galleries from New York or Berlin. But I think that we felt that there was an opportunity to create a, a fair that was much more representative of the diversity of what was happening. And so we kind of founded the fair on the three core values of quality, geographical diversity and accessibility. Um, we understood that we needed to have quality control that differentiated us from other fairs in the region that were perhaps organized by gallery associations and so on. Uh, we f saw the, the opportunity for this uh, representation of, of art from different cultural and aesthetic backgrounds was a really interesting one to try and pursue. Yeah. And I think accessibility was hugely important for us as well because we were trying to uh, expand the audience and I think that there's a real intimidation factor for those that aren't involved with the art world or in dealing with art from outside of their cultural backgrounds. Uh, so 
reducing the intimidation factor was a key principle for us. But we set out there to uh, try and persuade leading galleries to come. And in our first year, we'd managed to get 101 galleries from mm. 19 different countries to participate. I'm, I'm curious because you, you mentioned how back then Chinese contemporary art was really the, um, the, the, the major phenomenon that was getting a lot of attention. What was, the, uh, what was the appetite like of regional collectors back then for Western art? The, the two core markets, or the two key audiences for Western contemporary art and uh, modern art in Asia at that stage were in Taiwan and Korea, um, who had both had quite established gallery scenes, but also <laughs> collector bases that had been engaging with Western art for some time at auction. Um, and uh, so there was an appetite, but I think that there was, uh, within the Chinese collecting community, it was very much siloed towards the Chinese contemporary art initially. Mm -hmm. And so what was offered at auction in those days in Hong Kong was almost exclusively Chinese. Mm -hmm. And if you sort of fast forward to today, it's uh, only a relatively small proportion of the work that's sold in, in, in Hong Kong contemporary auctions is actually from China. And now, Emmy, you were on the selection committee back then in, yeah, in Art Yeah, Emmy played the major role. <laughs> so yeah. you, you had to you know, be the, the gatekeeper for the galleries who were coming in, but you also, I guess, had to persuade the galleries from outside of Asia why they would want to come all the way to this side of the world to, um, to bring their wares. Uh, so how, what, was the, what was the response like? What were those conversations like? I think, oh, well, before, thank you, so, thank you for having me um, talking galleries and Alan Schwartzman and Anne. Um, and I feel kind of sorry that I had to fly all the way from Singapore after last panel. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's really great to be here. Um, when I look back the first year when we did our HK, I think at that time the, the market between Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, Japan, it was kind of much, much smaller. And as Magnus said, um, people who are collecting contemporary art, they were focusing more on their regional artists, or at that time, really the, the emergence, very strong emergence of Ch Chinese contemporary art. So as one of the selection committee members, um, we really welcomed um, participation of galleries from outside of the region because we really felt that it was through fairs like Art HK, which then eventually became um, Art Basel Hong Kong, that the galleries, the landscape of our part of the world will be able to learn um, from the ecosystem that was in place in, from the West and try to kind of consolidate and, and make the foundation much stronger for the galleries, artists, and the institutional ecosystem there. Hmm. I mean, now we're clearly living in a vastly different time where, where it's, it's, it's dramatically changed global art market. And Emmy, you have a unique perspective on this change because you're half right. Korean by heritage. You grew up about an hour north of here yes. in, in Larchmont yes. and you've been spending the last 20 years in Singapore. So I wonder what would you say have been the most profound changes that you've seen in collectors um, you know, from, from East Asia or from, from your region specifically? Uh, and, and what do you think have, have been the most profound changes in the way that they're engaging with this international art market? I mean, I think Magnus would also agree that the collectors in Asian countries differ from one from, one from the mm -hmm. other. Um, they're not um, collecting um, the same type of works back then. I found the Korean collectors were very much more open to the Western art, especially the American art, I think, because historically speaking, South Korea and America, US had a very strong ties. But then when you look at Japanese collectors of contemporary art, they are, I mean, considering how many contemporary artists or events that they have in Japan, there are not that many contemporary art collectors. Mm -hmm. Then. Um, you, you look at the Southeast Asia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Indonesia particularly, they were collecting more of, of their artists of their region or the country. Fast forward now, I think because, I mean, partly due to Art HK becoming Art Basel Hong Kong, the collectors now are very much interested in what, is, what the Western artists are doing. And it, I'm kind of seeing this 
transition, I mean, maybe it already have happened in the last three years, the collectors of transitioning of collecting all those blue chip artists that we know mm -hmm. um, and are being auctioned. And one thing that is that sets the um, Asian collectors apart is that they feel very comfortable buying from the auctions almost more than buying from the galleries, would you say? Yeah, I would. I think that the, the, the market in Asia was predominantly auction-led, really. Certainly, that was the case in Hong Kong, that uh, by the time that we were looking at it, Hong Kong was already the third largest auction market mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. I think that the, also the, the, the platform of the contemporary Chinese auctions actually really gave uh, air to the market, really, for, for Chinese contemporary art and exposure that individu an individual gallery might struggle to have. I think it gave, gave it that breadth of exposure. And what would you say have been the, the most profound changes that you've seen in the collectors that you've been working with through, through the fairs? I, th I think it's, uh, it's quite natural for collectors when they're starting out to collect work that's quite conservative in nature and from their own particular country or culture. Yeah. Uh, and then to perhaps, once they get more established and more comfortable, to start collecting uh, contemporary work again, often from their own country. But once you start collecting contemporary art from your own country, it's not such a big leap to buy contemporary art from mm. elsewhere. And mm. I think we've seen very consistently over the last five to 10 years um, that, that collectors are really beginning to collect cross-culturally. So there has been this tremendous amount of work that's really been put into creating this, this east-west kind of dialogue. And it seems like it's really bearing fruit that it has, um, that has created a much more of a of a kind of a level playing field of sorts, not, not entirely, but more level than it used to be. And I mean, like, I think that the art fairs in our part of the world played a very significant um, part in the ecosystem. I mean, normally when we look at the art fairs, it's a, it's a trade show. Um, but, um, when we talk about the art fairs, it's, that's where you go and for the galleries to bring out their works and then sell to the visitors. But in in Asia, I think it was very instrumental in showing the relationship of galleries and the artists, the way they work. And I think in the last eight years, really, um, to, I mean, starting from Art HK to Art Basel Hong Kong, I, and also the migration or, or the expansion of the Western galleries having their outposts mm. in Asia, in Hong Kong, and now Seoul, as we know, um, and, and to some degree Singapore, I think it really helped the, the both the artists and the galleries to kind of understand how this whole ecosystem or the arts landscape work together mm -hmm. with the institutions as well as the collectors or the public out there. So really, um, this all the elements in that that we we know of arts ecosystem it was it, they were there, but they didn't really have we didn't really have the platform to do it, and that is one of the reasons why. Um, I kind of under STP, I initiated this small um, initiative called Sea Focus that is to bring out the attention to the Southeast Asia because Southeast mm -hmm. Asia is, is quite not so well known and outside of our region. So it is really a way to kind of educate the public and then inform the public uh, alike what the artists are doing today. Yep. Now this brings us to today, and, and please forgive a little exposition in this next question, but to, um, to provide a kind of the, um, the context, you know, we all know that Asian art buyers are wielding tremendous power on the global stage uh, today, and this is most palpable, as you mentioned, in the auction sphere, where Chinese buyers specifically are now, you know, they account for the second biggest population of, of buyers at auction and um, after the United States, and where collectors hailing from the region, in particular greater China, are snapping up a huge share of Western art on offer. Asia is also the fastest growing segment of the art market, propelled in part by the growth of new millionaires and billionaires in China, which is expected to outpace that of the United States over the next few years. But when thinking of the opportunities that this vast growth presents for the, the global art industry, it's vital to go down beneath the satellite eye view of the region and really focus on the specific regional hubs, because this is where they all present their own opportunities and their own challenges. And when it comes to Hong Kong, you know, the really the signal hub that we've all been, you know, interacting with over the past, you know, decade um, and a half, 
uh, it has had a very, very hard time of the past couple of years. I think that in the three years since Art Basel had its last truly international edition in the city, we've seen the, um, the clamping down of China on Hong Kong's cherished freedoms. The anti-extradition bill protests have, have really you know, made the city the, the epicenter of, of, of world attention. Um, and now most recently, the imposition of draconian anti-COVID regulations have dramatically accelerated the exodus of Hong Kongers fleeing the island, including a significant number of local artists and collectors. Now Hong Kong Art Basel is about to return next month. And this is a vastly changed uh, scenario. And I just wonder how viable is Hong Kong today as, as this, this true platform for the international art market to convene? Well, I think it, I mean, it, it, it remains to be seen, but I think that, um, I think that a, a fairer reflection will be once the veil of COVID lifts. Yeah. I think that, uh, uh, you know, at the moment, the, obviously the, the Hong Kong's primary role as a hub for a wide catchment area to be able to draw people in from different constituencies is a major selling point for, for it, but under the current COVID conditions, that's, that's challenging, as it is for anyone um, and for any location. Um, I think that uh, really the, the true reflection will come once, once COVID lifts. But I, I think that there have been some quite interesting indicators over the last couple of years. Everybody obviously at the moment is quite um, uh, focused on, on the downsides yeah. of what's happening in Hong Kong, but there has also been, um, you know, auction houses putting down major commitments there. Christie's have made a major commitment to real estate there to have a major Asia uh, HQ sale room, et cetera. And likewise, Philips has, um, has taken on a long-term lease in the West Kowloon Cultural District. Uh, and also, you have the opening of M Plus. And sadly, the opening of M Plus, um, for those of you who don't know, M Plus is a, a major new museum of uh, art and culture which is really coming from a, an Asia-centric focus, so really trying to present a different, um, uh, a different perspective on the world. And I think that the impact of that has not really been seen because nobody has been able to visit as of yet. So. I think that when the, you know, the veil of COVID list lifts, we're going to be left with the, um, the political situation. Mm. And I think that, you know, Emmy, as, as somebody who was on the selection committee back in the day, bringing, uh, bringing galleries to Hong Kong, do you think that, you know, going forward, as we see China having a, a stronger connection with, um, with, you know, Putin's Russia and the war in Ukraine, it seems like there there is a, a climate that is, um, that is developing, that might make it less of an attractive place for galleries from the West to go and 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 participate. I wonder if this is something that you think might be the case? Or do you think that, um, that, that dealers are maybe a little bit less um, idealistic than potentially the, the, the media? <laughs> well, I think it's the media. I mean, it, it sounded very, I mean, your kind of introduction of today's Hong Kong was quite dramatic. But I do think that, I mean, the one thing is real is that Hong Kong is not going to be the same as, as we knew Mm. 10 years ago. I mean, the city has changed. I, I came to New York on Sunday, and, and I felt there was a change in New York City since I was here just uh, in December. I mean, the air feels different, even though we're getting, I mean, we're saying that the, the spring is here. So I think Hong Kong, in that, in that way, that definitely it'll, it will not be the same city as the way we knew before. But I do think that the galleries who are in Hong Kong will not so easily leave. Um, uh, I think it's almost like, you know, when you go to an, a gallery, when you go to buy something and they say, they give you a price, it was $100, but then later they tell you it's $150. And you know that feeling as oh. to when you go into a store, you, you want to buy something and they say, actually it's $150. But then later you say, oh, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, it's $100. So it's that kind of feeling. What, whatever you used to have, you may not have had, you may not have it later. However, the things have changed, so you just have to live with it. Um, I do think that um, the Hong Kong, I mean, I haven't been to Hong Kong since, since two years, since COVID, mm -hmm. right? So um, I don't know how much has changed in the city, but definitely my friends are telling me it's, 
they are being very um, careful in what they say. However, in the daily living, day to day in the arts, I don't think there's going to be such a big change. The China market is huge, and we're talking mm -hmm. about there are fairs in Shanghai, there are fairs in Chengdu, there are fairs in Shenzhen, and I think each big cities have their own economy, and mm -hmm. so it, the, the art market in China will always be there, and that's why I think that it's time for the region to kind of, I mean, to, to see what else can we do, because I do feel that since COVID, the world has become truly global. While we are connected mm -hmm. globally through the web, the daily operations are really focusing where you are now. And I kind of saw that in, in, the, in America, in New York, as well as Europe. And we know that the galleries are not going to travel so easily now to go to a fair in Chengdu or Shenzhen, if you're a European gallery, American gallery, mm -hmm. but they will focus more on where they are. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really felt that for me, who's, who's based in Singapore, to really focus on our region, I thought it is really the right moment to do that. I mean, I think to, to, um, to go back to the auctions in Hong Kong, there's a reason why all these auction houses are making such an investment there. There's a reason why, you know, when, when they want to sell Botticelli's, you know, Man of Sorrows, they, they bring these major lots through Hong Kong on the way to the sale because it works. You know, clearly it, it taps into a major buying power over there. But I wonder, you know, Magnus, you've, you've spent over a decade and a half of your, of your life, I believe, living in Hong Kong. You literally wrote the book on the local art scene. And I wonder if maybe, how, how is, you're not, you've now been weathering the pandemic in, in Oxford. Do you feel like your relationship with the city has changed? Do you feel that you would ever want to see yourself living there again? Uh, I think, I mean, I left during, early, during, early during the pandemic in 2020, yeah, uh, in January 2020. We just finished the, um, the, the first, sorry, the second edition of Taipei Dangdai that week prior, so we just got under the wire. We were very, very fortunate. Um, uh, we left for a variety of reasons, um, but you know, in some ways, being being based in Hong Kong was a, a legacy from having been there to set up the art fair there. Hmm. Um, uh, and, and in fact, I had been looking at moving to Singapore. And so, if we had not uh, had the pandemic, I would actually be in Singapore. <laughs> but uh, we find ourselves in Oxford. But mm. uh, uh, that's the way of things. I'm very excited to talk about Singapore, as I think um, you, you both have a, uh, a, a great deal of expertise on the matter right now. But before we get there, I think um, Dangdai is actually coming up. Uh, that's in, right. Yes, we month. have the third edition of Taipei Dangdai mm -hmm. coming up next month. Um, so I will be flying out next week. Um, ordinarily, and for the first two editions, we had uh, around 100 galleries um, with a... Uh, with a a certain number of very strong Western galleries, at the, uh, of high-end Western galleries who have a very big commitment to Asia, many of whom have um, outposts in Hong Kong, uh, but then also a very strong representation of, of regional galleries. Mm -hmm. And so it was really probably 70% regional, 30% Western. Uh, and uh, for this edition, we've managed to persuade 60 galleries to come despite the COVID, condition, uh, the COVID conditions, the quarantine still in place. Of, uh, of 10 days, um, which I'll be going to do next, next Friday. Um, but uh, I think that we're, we're very fortunate in a sense, in terms of this local side of things, that with Taiwan, you have one of the strongest domestic collector bases of anywhere in Asia. Mm -hmm. And so I think for those galleries that are making the effort to go in, that they have got a good opportunity to, uh, to achieve what they want to achieve, uh, because the Taiwanese are there and uh, they've been uh, starved of the opportunity to see um, sort of major exhibitions and so on. So I think we've, we've uh, there's quite a lot of excitement out there at the moment. And how has the um, the, the city and it, it's it's kind of collecting population, it's collecting appetites, changed in the um, in the few years since you you founded it in 2019? Have you seen any kind of evolution? Any kind of any any surprises? Well, one of the really uh, rewarding surprises was that um, because the, the collector bases in, in Taiwan are not just based in Taipei, they're also in very established collector bases in Taichung in the south of the island, 
and in Tainan and Kaohsiung. Um, but one of the things that we've, we've, we're very happy to have been able to achieve was that we were able to introduce for the first time some of those uh, collectors to galleries from Taipei, and the, and the Taipei galleries were extremely grateful for that opportunity. Um, so I think that was probably one of the, one of the biggest surprises for us. Um, I, I think that through, I think one of the ways that it's important to try and expand the market and to bring people over perhaps who've been more comfortable buying from auction is to really have this emphasis on quality control and to have selection committees to be transparent about the process through which the galleries are selected. Um, because there are you know, different art fairs in different places whereby people are invited by the gallery association or what have you, where there isn't necessarily uh, this degree of, of, of uh, selectivity. And I think for people who are engaging with contemporary art for the first time, if you're going into a non-selected environment, it's quite difficult for you to sort of go in there freely and not to feel too self-conscious about the judgments you're making or the decisions you're making. And so I think that having this element of selectivity really provides a, a base comfort level mm -hmm. that people feel that they can't go too far wrong. I know, I mean, I, I want to turn to you, but I have one more question about Dang Dai <laughs> before, which is that, you know, you've, you've spent a lot of time building up this, this, great, um, this great fair there. I, I, I feel like I'm one of the few uh, Western journalists who's been there twice uh, with, with great pleasure. And um, yeah, I, I think you, know, you, you really gain a fondness for, for the city and for, for, for Taiwan. And um, we've seen you know, these same kind of very dark geopolitical clouds that have been gathering around Hong Kong and, and now Ukraine are, are kind of the potentially, there seems to be um, you know, some indications that they could be moving towards Taiwan. And I think that you know, the, uh, the ambassador, China's ambassador to the United States wrote a very blunt op-ed for the Washington Post where, where they said that um, you know, Taiwan is, is uh, an inalienable, you know, a, um, a, what was the, the term? Um, the future of Taiwan lies in the reunification of China, essentially. And, and I know that this has been, been going on for a long time. Um, the rhetoric is just getting a little hotter. So what is the, what is the atmosphere like in the art community in, um, in Taipei right now? I think overall it's pretty positive. I think they've had a relatively good pandemic. Um, and so the market has been quite buoyant. There's been a lot of people that have returned uh, to Taiwan during that time. So there's people who've been resident overseas um, who've, who've returned uh, to, to, tai to Taiwan during the pandemic. Um, as you rightly say, I think the status of Taiwan has been contested since 1949. Uh, so this isn't uh, something that's particularly new in terms of uh, the, the sort of pressures and, and the issue sort of hanging over uh, the, the situation. And I think people who are involved with Taiwan and have had business interests in Taiwan have been able to navigate that very successfully for, for decades. Um, and in terms of the appetite from the galleries participating, we don't see that changing at all. We've got great galleries from New York participating. We've got people like David Zwerner, mm -hmm. LGDR, who um, you know, I think that their presence in the Taiwan market really demonstrates the important role that the Taiwanese collectors play. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I think it's also interesting, you mentioned about the, um, the, the auction previews being toured to Hong Kong and Botticelli going to Hong Kong, etc. cetera. Um, uh, you know, one of my good friends, who's the, the chairman of Philips in Asia, was just in Taiwan uh, previewing the Basquiat. And uh, I think that it's also a testament to the strength of the Taiwanese market that the auction houses really do showcase their prize lots in the, in the Taiwan market. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great moment to uh, support the, the Taiwanese art world and, and, the, and the galleries there. Mm. And, um, and so, Emmy, uh, mm. as, as, the, as the person with the, um, the greatest tie to South Korea on, on the stage, I wonder another hub that is in the vein of Taipei that is um, that and, and Dong Dai that is 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 has a really rich um, history of collecting that is is really intricately tied to the global art market is obviously Seoul, and this September Freeze will be launching Freeze Seoul alongside the local KIAF fair uh, in the city, putting a global spotlight on the Korean capital. So, what would you say is the strategic appeal of Seoul for launching a uh, in addition to freeze, you know, what, why, why is this the place 
to bring that franchise into. Ooh, that question should have gone to Patrick, okay, ah, who's not here. But uh, yes, <laughs> Patrick is um, our ex war colleague, yeah. also on Basel committee, who went to freeze. But and, um, the strategic um, planning or, or so, I mean, I basically what I know about Seoul, I mean, I haven't lived there since I left the, the country when I was much younger, um, many, many years ago. Um, but Korean, South Koreans have great um, appetite and curiosity for new things and things that are of very high quality. And I think we've seen that in the art world that the proliferation of the galleries opening there in the last two years, actually, um, funnily enough, or maybe three years, um, and those who are there already have expanded, physically expanded, getting new spaces. So mm -hmm. I think the, the, the collecting market in Korea is very interesting. There are those who really collect because they want to buy and keep, but there are those who really see art as a commodity that they can, it can translate into many different types of investment, which we actually mm. see very strongly in, in Singapore, my part of the world. Um, so, and, and Korea being, I mean, having the, the history and the legacy of collecting Western art a lot more than any other Asian country that we know, and um, they, they are really going full force on, on buying art and they do mm. have great interest and there were, I mean, I think there, in the last five years there are quite a number of smaller um, art fairs that is organized by the domestic um, organizations like in Pusan and Tegu they have these two art fairs that have been going very, very strongly and of course Having biennials in Korea also helps a lot. Hmm. Kiev is a, an art fair that's been around for a very long time that has been organized by the, the Gallery Association of, of Korea. So, I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen in September. Hmm. There is a very large um, domestic yeah, art market there. Yeah. I think maybe maybe it's best uh, to move to Singapore. Yes. Since <laughs> maybe not. I, I know that you you're moving there. I'm, I'm moving there in a rhetorical fashion. <laughs> um, but so you are now going to be opening Art SG. There's been a uh, a, a, a big um, epic journey that this fair has it taken. It has been a long lead up. Yeah, that's right. I've been waiting. Yeah. We've been waiting. There, there have been four four um, consecutive delays uh, due to multiple different um, acts of God. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I wonder, what is it? I, well, before, before I ask you about Singapore, I, I think that you know, from our conversations over, over, um, over the years, actually, Magnus, you know, uh, it seems to me that you have a little bit of a theory of art fairs, where there, there are hub art fairs, there are more regionally specific art fairs, that they all have a, a, a kind of a, a, a place in the solar system of an art market in a particular region. And, and how do you see um, a fair in, in Singapore relating to a fair in Hong Kong, relating to a fair in Seoul, relating to a fair in um, Taipei? So I think that the, um, when you're looking at a place to set up a fair, you've got to really think about the natural context and the natural catchment area for that particular place and the characteristics of that, of that place. Um, Fairs in different places make sense for different reasons. Uh, and so uh, having a, an approach that fits that makes a lot of sense. So um, you know, I think that places like Taiwan, Korea, Japan have a very, or Japan probably less so, but has great potential, have very strong domestic markets or have the potential for strong domestic markets. Um, and I think that the reason people want to go to those places is to, uh, as a gallery, is to really primarily engage with those audiences. So you do a fair in Taipei primarily to engage with the Taiwanese collectors, although you very much hope that you'll see the Japanese and so on who um, have a natural affinity with Taiwan uh, and committed collectors from around the region. Um, but I think that for, you know, the, the, the things that make a, a, a place uh, suitable for a major hub fair 
a really um, uh, geographical location, uh, great, in, in, great transport links, uh, great infrastructure, um, great restaurants and hotels. Uh, I think if English is commonly spoken, then I think that that can help a great deal. So I think all of those things really helped Hong Kong. Uh, uh, and I, I think that uh, it's interesting, in, in the early days of, of, uh, of Hong Kong, when I was advocating for Hong Kong over a competitor fair in, in Singapore, I was always saying that Singapore was geographically a little bit too far south, um, and that whilst it had many of the same qualities as, of, of, as Hong Kong in terms of that naturally very wide catchment area, a great transport links, etc. Uh, 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 but, but now I, th I think that having that geographical distance uh, from, from China is no bad thing in the sense of it really being the only place in Asia that's truly regarded as, as neutral territory. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's incredibly important. It's a place where everybody feels equally comfortable going. English is commonly spoken, uh, or is, is widely spoken. Uh, Chinese is commonly spoken. There's whatever food you want to get, and so on. Um, but I think that the catchment area for, for Singapore is Singapore itself, obviously. But it's really a hub for, you need all the different constituencies from around the region to make it work. And so you need to get the Indonesians to come. You need to get the, the Philippine collectors to come. You need to get the Thai collectors to come, uh, and so on. Uh, but beyond the Southeast Asia region, there's also a bit of India and a bit of Australia. And then it's how those audiences can, uh, or those communities can come together in Singapore and engage with the rest of Asia because there hasn't really been the opportunity for Southeast Asia uh, and the Indo-Pacific to really have a connection with, um, with the rest of Asia in this kind of way. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's very interesting if one looks at how the discourse has been changing over the last five years I think that people have been switching in, in the terminology, and I think terminology is very important, it reflects the mindset and so on, that people have been switching the terminology from talking about the Asia-Pacific to talking about the Indo-Pacific. And I think whereas it, you couldn't really make the claim for Singapore to be capital of the Asia-Pacific, mm. it's actually, a, absolutely the natural meeting place for the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think there's a very exciting moment there. Uh, over the last couple of years, things have been really changing as well in Singapore. Um, a huge amount of wealth has been flooding into Singapore. Singapore has always been the private wealth management hub of, of Asia, uh, but there's been a huge influx of wealth over the last uh, couple of years. In the last year alone, uh, the number of family offices has doubled from 200 to 400, uh, and the minimum viable assets you have to have under management to make such a structure makes sense is about 100 million US dollars entry level. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, right. it's quite substantial. Where is it coming from? Uh, it's coming from, uh, from all over, but from China, from Hong Kong. Um, there's a big, been a big growth in the Chinese community within Singapore. A lot of Chinese have been moving in. Um, it's also been quite interesting, but for different reasons. I think that the, there's been a strong uh, influx of Indonesians who've had perhaps a place in Singapore, but who've also been camping out during the pandemic due to the s sort of superior healthcare and COVID mitigation measures and so on. But uh, a lot of people have said that for the first time they feel a sense of community because in the past they had a very linear relationship with Singapore and that it was about private matters of finance and healthcare. That now they've all been there at the same time and they've been able to, to meet up with each other. They have children in school there now. So I think that some of that's going to stick for the long term. Um, it will be interesting to see how that develops, but, uh, uh, but that's, it, it's more than a few people that have mentioned this as a phenomenon. And, and Emmy, you, you've mm -hmm. seen the potential in Singapore for, for a long time. For I, mean, I live there. <laughs> it's my home now. Yeah. I mean, I got to Singapore because I married a Singaporean, so mm -hmm. that's where I am. Um, yeah, I mean, as Magnus said, Singapore has changed quite a lot. Um, the government also has, I mean, it's been in the same party since independence, since 1965, People's Action Party. Mm -hmm. So it's been really stable in the part of the region. And I think that's why Singapore is kind of a, the magnet to do a lot of businesses. And um, Singapore being a country that doesn't have any natural resource, the only resource is really there. It's our infrastructure and the people who are there. 
So if you're going to do um, set up businesses or anything else that is really looking to the future, it is really a perfect place to be. And in the last, yeah. I would say in the last seven years, there was a already huge influx of um, different, um, different country people coming in, especially in the tech area. So we have a very, very large um, Indian community um, as well but also from Europe. I mean, they're coming from everywhere. And then in the last, I would say, two to three years, I've seen the raw increase in the Korean community as well as, of course, Chinese community that we know. But these communities are very, very independent of each other, even within this such a small city. But it is really a reflection of what Singapore can do for the, the, the region of Asia Pacific, I think. Um, and it's, there's a lot of potential, of course, I mean, for businesses like ours, which is kind of a luxury, luxury industry, that's how I put it to my team, is that, but these people who come in with a lot of money doesn't necessarily translate to art buyers. I mean, as we know, I mean, it's, it's, it's gonna take a long time to kind of educate the public, just like what Hong Kong has gone through in the last 10 years, so it's, it's, so it's, a, it's a long haul. It's not going to happen overnight. And the galleries who are in Singapore in the region or the fairs like RSG or um, my boutique platform, we really have the responsibility to kind of share with the public what is contemporary art and what are the artists mm. doing and what are they really thinking about. And we talked about this climate um, issue previous talk is that there are artists who are actually talking about this in our part of the world and mm -hmm. as we know that this year's castle is is um, curated by Ruang Grupa, the, the group from Indonesia. So we are actually making a little footprints here in, in, in different parts but it's really now in Singapore with RSG and C Focus this is when we really want to kind of come together to make the mm -hmm. statement so that people outside of our region can hear us mm -hmm. what we're trying to do near equator, one degree 15, yeah. Right, it's, uh, unbe yeah, speaking of the climate, it's, it's uh, how many, 85 miles north of, of the equator. Yeah, which is, um, one degree 15. Very, uh, I just wanted to build on something that Emmy was saying about the tech sector, because Singapore has been very proactively trying to uh, court the tech and innovation sectors. And a lot of businesses have been opening up there and a lot of entrepreneurs have been encouraged to set up their businesses there. Um, uh, I mean, one example is just two weeks ago, James Dyson announced or opened the, the, the new, his new global headquarters in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, in the St. James Power Station, which I think he liked the name of. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I've, I think that that's kind of a, an interesting moment. That Singapore's also been very welcoming of the crypto community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that whilst one, you know, the jury may still be out on, uh, on, on certain aspects of things, I think that the art world is very curious to encounter the crypto world. And I think that Singapore is a very good place for those two worlds to rub up against each other. I mean, the, the buyer of the people um, was based in Singapore. Medical. Well. I definitely want yeah. to get to the, the, the mm -hmm. tech collectors out there yeah. because if there's anything that makes dealers salivate, it's, uh, it's tech collectors. Um, <laughs> But so I think, you know, Emmy, you, you launched C Focus back in 2019. Yes, 2019. And around the same time, um, there was a, another affair that was fizzling out. And I believe, yes. you know, Lorenzo Rudolph was this larger in life, larger than life fair impresario who really helped build up the Art Basel brand, you know, made it selective. Uh, he, he was helping to launch Art Basel Miami Beach. Um, and he ran a fair in Singapore called Art Stage, which for a few years kind of had dwindling, um, you know, performance, dwindling, dwindling, uh, dwindling exhibitors. And then suddenly, um, about a week before it was supposed to debut, uh, he canceled it. And, and so the exhibitors had all their art already shipped. There it was a real kind of a, a scandal. And in the statements around the time that he made um, in explaining why the fair wasn't working out. He said that the, the local art scene was just not strong enough to support a fair. You, you evidently have found a way to do it. And what, what do you think was the, the mistake 
um, that brought down Art Stage Singapore, and what do you think is the, the solution to the, the problem? Magnus. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, well, I actually, I mean, yeah, Magnus, maybe a bit, but I think that there was, with, with uh, for, for Hong Kong, I mean, I think Hong Kong really played a role. We, mm. we really were in a competitive situation in early, early 2010s, uh, and I think that, you know, they came out of the blocks quite strong uh, and had a very good first edition, and we realized that we really needed to go uh, go for scale. And so between 2010 and 2011, I, we recruited, um, we went up from 155 galleries to 255 galleries in a year. So we went from one floor of the convention center to full, a full two floors of the convention center. And I think that it kind of just made it clear that that was the, that Hong Kong was going to be the, the de, de facto hub. Um, but I think also it's important as well that you know, Lorenzo played a very important role in Shanghai as well. I think that what he did in Shanghai with SH Contemporary in 2007 kind of paved the way for a lot of the things mm. that have been achieved since. So I think that it, it needs to be acknowledged the role that he, he played. Um, but I think also in a sense that um, organizing an art fair is a serious business, it requires a whole infrastructure, different skill sets, and different aspects of the team, and so on. And I think that Lorenzo um, was very entrepreneurial, but it was also something of a, a one-man band. It was kind of a family business, which I'm sure was incredibly stressful and uh, difficult to logistically to make work, and so on. Um, and I think that you know we're, we we were in a different situation, having very complementary um, experiences within our team in in Hong Kong, uh, to be able to understand the nature of logistics and operations and a promotions campaign, making you know, business management, having a viable business model that could secure sufficient sponsorship and ticket revenue to make, make it viable for the long term. And, and I think that that's something that he didn't have at his disposal. So essentially the, the he wasn't thinking big enough. He didn't have the, he didn't have, um, the, the proper scale of an operation. And I, that begs the question, how, how big do you think Art SG um, can become? Um, well, already we're sort of, um, for the first edition, we're going to be looking at around about 130 galleries. We're mm -hmm. still recruiting at the moment, but we're well over 100 already of top level international galleries. Mm -hmm. um, some, some of the best galleries from the region, but also very good galleries from Europe and America. And consensus seems to be very much building within the international art world that Singapore is going to be uh, a big deal. Um, which is very exciting. Um, you know, I think uh, for us in terms of how we build the fair, we need to concentrate on concentric circles. So we need to concentrate on building the audience in Singapore, Southeast Asia, India, Australia, and then how that can be engaging with the rest of Asia. Um, and in terms of the bigger picture stuff, it, in terms of whether or not it becomes the de, fa de facto hub for, for a wider catchment area still, uh, that will be up to external circumstances, but we just have to make sure that we get it right in terms of the uh, of, of the regional play, the Singapore play, and then the and the pan regional Asia play. And um, it, it sounds like it's going to be a, a big event with the the two fairs happening side by side. Yeah. A lot of galleries are going to be going over there. Now, one thing that's kind of the flip side of of Singapore's. Uh, incredible infrastructure and 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 you know great success with COVID is that it is, it's not ex it's a tightly run um, uh, state. It is it is um, it has. I, I think you know from growing up in America in the 90s you would hear about about teenager Americans over there getting caned for doing graffiti and and I think that it's still it has um, it is it's very strict about certain aspects of art that you can't show. Um, and I wonder, how do you convey this to the galleries that are coming over there from, from overseas who may not be familiar? What, what are the kind of rules of the road in terms of what you can show in the fairs and, and what you can't? I mean, for me, I, because I work with galleries around the region, they know Singapore very well, so that is not really something that's on top, top of my list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably, Magnus, you would have to, with all yeah, the Western I think galleries. It's, um, you know, censorship is something that has to be navigated in many different places around the world. Um, I think that Singapore has um, a lot of 
different races and religions, and the motivation for is very much to try and pr pr um, what do you call it? maintain harmony to a degree. So I think that um, you know that uh, things that are of a gratuitous sexual nature or that are depicting extreme violence or that are uh, politically very sensitive are things that aren't going to necessarily fit the context so well. Um, but as I say, people are, you know, galleries are very used to navigating these territories and mm. in, uh, in countless other locations around the world. And wh who does the, the, um, the onus lie to make sure that the work is, it, does it get pre-screened in terms of saying, I want to bring this work is this, uh, is this within the bounds of, of acceptability, or is it, is it you bring it and, and see what happens? There's no pre-screening. There's no, no there's pre-screening. No pre -screening. Yeah. I mean, it's really, um, I think it, it's dependent on the gallery that, that they're going to bring the work. I mean, as Magnus says, Singapore, we, I mean, our official language, there are four official languages. It's Mandarin, English, Tamil, which is a dialect of South India, and Malay which is of the Malayan Peninsula. Um, so Singapore, with these four official languages there, the government is very, very mindful of not uh, disturbing, not promoting violence against the religion or the different ethnic groups, because it's just really such a um, diverse uh, ethnic groups living in Singapore. And nor do they, basically, they don't want you to publicly on purpose promote um, some of the sexual um, issues. Um, so as long as you're, you are aware of that, um, I think you'll be fine because, I mean, you know, I was telling you during our conversation in the 70s that they didn't let, Singapore didn't let guys with long hair. You had to have, you had to have all your hair shorter than your ear. So, um, so they just want to, but it's, it's been really kind of mitigated. It's much, much smoother. I mean, you'll go to cinemas. I think the only, only screening part that we have now is the cinema. Uh, but even then, uh, with, through a lot, uh, Singapore Film Festival and Singaporean filmmakers participating in um, foreign film festivals, I mean, even that in an artistic realm, they have loosened up the, the censorship quite a lot. I think, though, to be clear, when you say sexual issues, I believe that encompasses LGBTQ yes. plus um, depictions. Right. And I think that that is um, that is that is something that maybe uh, Western galleries might not be so prepared to um, to naturally understand mm -hmm. is something that is an issue. In but then, if you bring it up, it becomes an issue. So it's like it's your choice whether do you want to make an issue out of it or do you want to just leave it to kind of interpretation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I think, um, I mean, is this something that has to be communicated to the Western galleries, or is this something that... Um, it's something that we will be communicating yeah. to the Western galleries, in, or to all galleries in our sort of exhibitor manuals and so on. But there is uh, guidelines on the government website about, uh, about things. So there's an there's a, uh, organization called the IMDA who kind of oversee uh, the film. The film thing, yeah. yeah. And so there is a, a new generation of collectors in Asia that is extremely wealthy, digitally savvy, if not digital first. Uh, they're totally fired up about Western art and they're willing to make very quick decisions. And I think, you know, when I, I, I think of Justin Sun as a great example of this, uh, the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the blockchain billionaire, um, young, young guy from China who uh, learned about Giacometti about three hours before he decided to drop $78 million on, on that at auction. And um, by all accounts, as we, we spoke about, uh, these buyers prefer to buy at auction because they, you can do it on, on your phone from anywhere. You, know, um, you, you get the feeling that this is a, a valid price because there's bidding that is public that you can see that there, there's somebody willing to pay something approximate to what you're willing to pay. And if you want, you can get some headlines out of it. Uh, by you know letting letting them know who who you are, um, so these must be very uh, important kinds of buyers to get to a fair. How how can you how do you how do you make sure that you're getting these this new generation of very plugged in buyers to come to um, to you know not the metaverse but the actual 
the, the meat space of the art fair. Well, for, for, I mean, we've included a sector specifically to try and encourage um, uh, an engagement with these tech-related audiences. So we have a digital sector called Reframe, um, which is uh, not exclusively going to be about NFTs, but NFTs will be included in it. Uh, so it's, a, it's open to uh, galleries who are participating to present work that's primarily created in the digital media. And we wanted to create... So we want to have a sector that wasn't necessarily exclusively about the hype of NFTs, but mm. that actually could kind of contextualize things and have a qualitative discussion or start a qualitative discussion um, and provide a bit of context. It's very interesting. I mean, there's a huge crypto community in, in Singapore, as you mentioned. Um, there's also a very devoted uh, NFT buying community um, mm -hmm. in China, that mm. is, uh, which, is, which, is, which is notable because cryptocurrency is obviously illegal, but NFTs are not illegal in China. So do you see, um, do you see NFTs as being a kind of a, a way of, 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 of tapping um, into this new uh, collection of, of buyers? I mean, do, do you see NFTs as having a place at, at Sea Focus? I mean, funnily enough, I have like avoid, I, I tr I've tried to avoid NFT for the last year. And finally, this January, the last iteration that we did, we actually partnered with Tezos um, to, to present their NFT work. And I think, as Magna said, the reason why I went into it was because we really wanted to kind of share what is NFT. I'm still trying to figure it out. The only thing that I could get out of it is just like a vehicle to validate your own crypto. But anyway, I'm sure there's a much deeper um, study on that. But um, I, I think the, Right now in Singapore, in the region, yeah, those who are really in cryptocurrency, it's very, very different. Dif I see that there are two different trajectories. I mean, the art that we like and NFT is completely like different in parallel. But the last iteration, I met a client of ours or, or our one of our patrons who's been um, who's in finance sector, and. He was, he was buying a lot of, as an American, he was buying a lot of regional art because he's been, he and his family have spent a long time there. But he told me that basically Helen Frankenthaler, Rothko, these will not, this will not be worth anything in the down the line. It's not gonna be like existing. And I was like, what? And he said, maybe Basquiat and Warhol. Okay. And then he said, Old masters is there because it's for the education. Now, I just like tried to wrap my head around like what is he trying to say? But I realized that he has been in NFT. He's been invest as a cryptocurrency trader, I guess, or or um, investor. He's been studying and buying NFT for I think four years now, and it's just like suddenly he dropped everything. He's just not interested anymore buying painting, sculptures, or whatever. <laughs> that we know. <laughs> so I'm just hoping that the other people are not going to be like that. It's <laughs> going to be a fact. <laughs> because Singapore is such a concentrated place for there's such high density of financiers and everything mm. is tied to finance and investment that the people who buy art, I mean, it's just like, you know, when, when China went through this whole reorganization of education um, sector, most of my, my clients or patrons, just they were just so busy during the day, during, even my board members, because China was going through this whole reorganization of the education fund. Hmm. So I'm, it, it's a very interesting place. Singapore is a very, very interesting place to have art um, market to have been there. So that's why I, I just want to go back to say that we, the galleries, and we art fair organizers have really a lot of responsibility mm. to share what is about art that we're trying to promote. Mm. And also the galleries that are coming, yes, they are coming to, 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 to do their business, but really, and, and it's so important for us to work with the galleries who are responsible, mm. who are responsible sellers and really inform the buyers what happens after you buy and like please do not put it in the auction do, don't do the flipping and things mm -hmm. like that so um, I'm just hoping that this whole NFT 
um, this new phenomena or, or the interest will kind of stabilize because mm -hmm. it's still very much in the onset of the beginning of this new fad. But I think it has also opened up the audience for arts and creativity in general. So I think that <laughs> it could be the gateway drug to collecting real art. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I think we're, we're going to open the questions up for the audience. I want to steal one more before I, I do. I have, I have a lot more. I mean, we haven't even talked about MCH. We haven't talked about Japan. Uh, and, um, but, you know, on the heels of the last conversation, I think it's, there's a, the, another dimension of the digital picture is that you can also open up digital avenues for people instead of traveling all the way from the West uh, out to, to Singapore to have ways of, of participating with the fair virtually or you know, um, through digital tools. Is that, is that something that, is, that you're thinking about? Because we saw you know, not only is there the shipping costs, but there's also all the airfare that's attached to, to, um, to art fairs. And for Western buyers who are very interested in engaging with, um, with the Asian, you know, Asian art, the Asian art market, uh, that, is a, that is a hefty yeah. Carbon load. I mean, I think it's going to be a very important um, part of our offerings. If you can, and and especially being Singapore, is like if you take direct flight from New York to Singapore, you have to be in the plane for an eighteen and a half hours. So it's not like it's it's not next door. And and after last segment, I'm not going to encourage everybody <laughs> to come to Singapore. But um, so this whole digital offering, I know that we are really tired of OVR, but it is, it is a very important part of, of our presentation to connect with the people who are very, very far away. So at least they are able to see what we have to offer. But I do feel as well that people are very, very hungry for that in-person experience now and for the opportunity to get together, to share passions, to meet each other, mm -hmm. to have the kind of serendipity of meeting people in the aisles of an art fair mm -hmm. um, or in um, sort of an event outside, I think is, is something that people are really hankering for as well. It's almost hard to remember that in 19, uh, 2019, everybody, all the panels were about fatigue and yeah. exhaustion with art fairs. Yeah. Uh, but let us go to the, the audience here. Um, Forgive me, my vision is terrible, but I see a, a hand oh, back there with a microphone. Hello? Oh, there we go. Hi. Um, as someone who is very engaged, actually, in Asian art, Japanese post-war art, to be specific, but I wondered, I feel like the emergence of the art market for, emanating from Hong Kong and China began in the kind of late mid 90s and Hong Kong was seen as this neutral bastion of free trade. So now I think based also on what you were saying and I'd love for you all to both of our speakers to discuss the changes in the tax law in Korea and what exists also in Singapore. Singapore seems like a free trade zone. Do you think maybe the future Asia, the hub of the 21st century, is going to turn more bipolar to, to meaning Singapore, Korea? That's one question that I have. And the other question is, how do you integrate actually the Japanese art market in your strategies? Curious about that. Well, maybe if I Take the, if I could start, if that's okay, Amy. The, the, with the, the Japanese side of things, I think the, uh, the Japanese market, or the Japanese cultural production has been you know, it's extraordinarily sophisticated. Um, and we have a, a, a very, very strong relationship with the Japanese galleries um, across the board. So really from the early days of Hong Kong onwards, um, we have a, a very strong presence of Japanese galleries in our fair in Taipei, in Taipei Dangdai, because of the shared uh, colonial history of the Japanese occupation of Taiwan. There's a very strong affiliation between, uh, between Taiwan and, and Japan. And actually to, to travel from Songshan Airport to, to, uh, to Tokyo Haneda is, is a very, very short trip. Uh, it's almost like a bus ride. Uh, so we get a, a lot of interaction there. 
So it's very much integrated into our plans for, uh, for, for Taiwan. Um, likewise, we've been getting a very, very solid um, uh, sign up rate from Japanese galleries for Singapore who are all expressing their interest in being there. So we'll have 10 to 15 major Japanese galleries uh, present at the fair as well. So Japan is incredibly important to us. Um, as Emmy was saying, the, the Japanese expat community in Singapore is quite strong. It's quite siloed, so we need to find our way in uh, to those communities. Um, but, but Japan is, uh, is a very important part of, of our strategies overall. Is it, is it the case? I, I, I believe that you may be even in talks with Japan about potentially starting a fair over there. We're, we're, we're looking very, very seriously at it, and we have people on the ground who've been doing a lot of research for us. Very exciting. Well, there are two Japanese galleries. Um, they have outposts in Singapore, Mizuma and Ota, so they have been there since, I think, maybe eight years? Eight years, so um, they're very integrated into the Southeast Asian market. Um, going back to Hong Kong, I guess, to your earlier question, I think the, the art market will still be there. I think it's just that right now, we, with the, with the um, quarantine measure being up to 21 days, it's just ha you know, deterring people to go, there, go in there. But I do think that there, the, the art market in Hong Kong will still be very strong. It's just reduced, yeah. actually, from 1st of April, I think it reduced to seven, seven days. days. Yeah. 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 Hong Kong. Um, I think that a Asia is big enough um, to have two major fairs. I mean, Southeast Asia in and of itself has got a population of 650 million people. It's about <laughs> the same size as Europe. It's home to many of the fastest growing economies mm -hmm. in the world. So logic dictates that, that uh, Southeast Asia can deserves a fair in its own right, as, as does uh, north, further north. So is, is Asia the future of the art market? Uh, I think that's the, the yeah. I think that the, the okay. potential. We will have our yes. market. Yeah. But the potential for <laughs> the potential for growth is is yes. extraordinary because yeah. it's still a, a relatively nascent market. There's a huge amount of work to do in terms of developing the audiences yeah. there, yeah. and I think that Europe and uh, America um, are both relatively mature in terms of their market status, um, whereas there's just there's a huge amount of work to do in terms of reducing the intimidation factor, bringing new collectors in mm -hmm. to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't see that sort of running out of steam anytime soon. But it's a, it's a I mean, industry. you know, but art market requires more than just the galleries and fairs. I mean, we have to have institutions, we have to have the public who is informed and knowledgeable to sustain the market to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. So I think yesterday's opening panel about what's going on right now between the younger galleries and the museums and the collectors, we have to really, we have a chance to avoid that kind of thing happening in, in Asia. And I think it is really very important for local uh, art galleries associations, whether Hong Kong, Singapore, Seoul, uh, Seoul or Japan. I mean, the Gallery Week in Tokyo is initiated by the galleries in, in, in Tokyo. So these, these little organizations have really, I mean, they play a critical role in in, in cementing the foundation for the market that we're trying to create in Asia and as fair organizers. Um, I mean, I, actually, I have to, can I just say, I, I run a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. called SDPI Creative Workshop and Gallery, and C Focus is really kind of under the edges of our ministry, and we're trying to um, solidify the market for Southeast Asia. So I'm not really as profit driven and I don't think I could work for profit driven organization but I that's why I, I keep just repeating myself that it is so important to start on the right footing mm. in our part of the world because this whole arts ecosystem and arts landscape for us and this western notion is very very new and as we mentioned that auction house still plays such an important part of this this transactional um, space that uh, people, I'm, I'm constantly talking to people to say the auction market is not the real reflection of the art market. There's a whole other, the real art market mm -hmm. is where the fairs are, where the galleries are working mm -hmm. with primary, um, mm -hmm. in the primary market. So this is where we have to do our work. Yeah. It's interesting that, uh, you know, Amy Capalazzo, Yuki Taras, and Adam yeah. Chin, they've started, you know, AIG, which is entirely geared towards teaching collectors how to, you know, build this ecosystem. 
which might be a boom, a boom industry. Um, are there any other questions up over where yeah. with? Uh, Hi. Um, uh, uh, as a gallerist in New York, interested in kind of exposing emerging artists in Asia, uh, kind of early in their career and mid-career, but kind of emergent artists. I was wondering if there was much of an appetite for artists coming from New York, American artists, uh, for artists that maybe aren't very well recognized, um, and if so, if there are particular regions where, where there is more of an appetite than other, other um, areas. And then I guess as further to that, what would you recommend, how would you recommend uh, galleries build a better bridge uh, from the US uh, to Asia and, and these various uh, kind of regions? Um, because I think it's something that's very exciting and interesting to us, but uh, there's a lot of unknowns there too. My, my suggestion to start with would be to come and visit. Come and, come and, see, come and see us in, in Singapore January. in January. <laughs> um, and, and just do your, do your research, talk to people. Um, from different parts of Asia, uh, and I think you know, Asia is obviously a, a big place. There are different markets that have different particularities. Um, what I would say is, in general, that it's still a relatively young market. It's a relatively nascent market. So anything that's going to be heavy-duty conceptual with no visual payback is going to struggle a bit. Mm. Um, but uh, I mean, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards um, if, if you wanted to. Uh, to, to have a conversation about um, ab about things, but uh, but come come to Singapore in January. Oh, one more. Let's see. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Hi. Um, as an art advisor based in New York, I actually have clients in Singapore, and my experience with them is that they are supportive of art in Singapore from the perspective of a sort of local art, regional, it doesn't impact the way that they form their collection very much. Um, it reminds me very much of how the Los Angeles art market evolved over the last 30 years or so from a regional market to a, a robust market where people are buying and acquiring and supporting art locally in a way that has a global purview. And so my question with regards to my experience with my clients is, um, as you encourage the local collecting community to think of Singapore as a global marketplace for acquiring art, do you do that by working from the outside in and engendering the support of the global art network to support and bolster the Singapore community? Or are you working locally within, let's say, the government or other cultural agencies and organizations, which from my experience also seem a lot less focused on contemporary visual art than, let's say, contemporary popular culture or commerce? Um, I, guess I'll take that. Um, I think if your clients are um, already aware of this wanting to support the local market, even though they, it doesn't fit into their collection, that means they are very much in the know of what is happening. So I think to just to um, answer your question really short, I think we have to work both inside out mm. and outside in. Um, and really, these the, your clients would be the perfect people to really be the patron of things that we are trying to do, especially um, for C Focus, where we're really trying to promote the awareness of the region and not necessarily only Singapore, but the, for the region and what the, what the regional market can be done or could become. So yeah, I would like to know your clients. Can they be my <laughs> patrons and, <laughs> and speakers, flag bearers for our region? They would be great. I'm, again, I'm really sorry to, to cut this conversation off, but as they said, you know, please, please do approach and introduce yourselves afterwards. Um, I wanted to thank you all so much. Thank you, Andrew, Emmy, and Magnus for being here, for coming all the way here. Um, that was a great conversation.